Taiwan's former president Ma Ying-jeou announces a historic and controversial trip to China. Chinese leader Xi Jinping is in Moscow to meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Taiwan wins silver at an international Taekwondo event in Belgium. Plus, a play highlighting humanitarian work in conflict zones takes the stage in Taipei. A warm welcome to Taiwan Plus News. I'm Leslie Liao. Former President Ma Ying-jeou has announced he will visit China later this month. His trip will be the first time that one of Taiwan's former presidents has traveled across the strait in over 70 years. Eric Gao has details. A historic announcement. Former President Ma Ying-jeou's foundation says Ma is heading to China. He'll be there from March 27th to April 7th. It'll be the first time that a former leader of Taiwan has been to China since 1949. A spokesperson for Ma says the trip will help ease tensions between the two sides. This isn't Ma's first groundbreaking trip. In 2015, during his second term, Ma met with China's leader Xi Jinping in Singapore. It was the first meeting of leaders from the two sides since 1945. But he's not expected to meet with Xi this time. His itinerary will take him to places like Nanjing and Shanghai, but not Beijing. It's still unknown whether he will meet with any Chinese officials. However, the ruling Democratic Progressive Party is urging Ma not to let his visit be used by Beijing for propaganda purposes. The trip comes as tensions between Beijing and Washington are escalating. There are concerns that Ma's visit could send the wrong message to the U.S. about Taiwan's position. But Ma's foundation says the trip is mostly about cultural and historic exchanges and that Ma wants to use this trip to educate Taiwan's young people about the country's past ties with China. People in Taiwan and the U.S. will be closely watching Ma's trip to see whether it is just for cultural exchanges or if it turns out to be slightly more political than that. Alex Chen, Sam Hui, and Eric Gao for Taiwan Plus. Chinese leader Xi Jinping plans to meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow on Monday. It will be Xi's first trip to Russia since the country invaded Ukraine last year and is aimed at promoting bilateral ties between the two countries. The trip is scheduled to last two days. According to a statement from Beijing, the visit will be a journey of friendship, cooperation and peace. China has been trying to position itself as a neutral party following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But in the past, China has repeated Russian propaganda, such as accusing NATO and the United States of provoking Moscow into taking action. For more on what to expect from the meeting between the Russian and Chinese leaders, our reporter Jaime Okan spoke to Matthew Sussex, a security analyst with the Griffith Asia Institute based in Sydney, Australia. Can you talk about the significance of this trip? Yeah, look, it's uh, very significant that she is going to Moscow to uh, to visit Putin on a number of levels. The first level, I think, is to, I guess, send a note of reassurance to the government in Russia um, that Beijing continues to provide, you know, a degree of, of support for, for Russia's position, if not the actual invasion of Ukraine, um, then Russia's position vis-a-vis -vis NATO, vis-a-vis -vis the United States, uh, and, and so on. So Beijing has quite consistently provided that rhetorical support to uh, the Kremlin. Um, and the question is now whether or not that translates into something a little bit more formal and a bit more material. There have been some uh, reports over about the last 48 hours that China has been engaged in uh, sending body armor uh, and even small arms to, uh, to Russia. Now, that's probably not the game changer that uh, many would think about um, when they look at whether China is, is abandoning the sort of straddle diplomacy between the West and Russia. 
Uh, but nonetheless, I think it's a, it's a fairly significant development. What is Beijing trying to accomplish with this trip? Is it trying to take steps towards brokering a peace deal between Russia and Ukraine? It depends very much as to uh, how far she is prepared to go um, in uh, propping up Putin and propping up this, this frankly, failing war, uh, which will, will be, I think, a test of the robustness of, of the sort of no limits partnership between Moscow and Beijing. I think Beijing very much wants to sell its, its 12 point peace plan. Um, and, and that basically has carrots and sticks for all sides. Um, it's got you know, sticks for Russia with the expectation from China that nuclear weapons won't be used, that uh, you know, uh, nuclear power plants will be kept safe, uh, but also you know, having a, a stab at the United States by saying the formation of blocks is unhealthy, sanctions should be wound back and, and, and so forth. Uh, so you know, at the very least, this is a document from Beijing to cement uh, Russia's control over large portions of, of Ukraine. So now that's what's going on behind the scenes. Um, in terms of the optics of it, I think Beijing is probably looking to, to kickstart a little bit of international enthusiasm um, in its peace plan because it was you know, received in a decidedly lukewarm way. What does this say that China's President Xi Jinping is going to visit an indicted war criminal? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, an objective assessment on whether, you know, China should get more heavily involved in the war on Ukraine and, you know, by, by, for instance, arming Russia, an objective assessment would say that's not in Beijing's interests. But Xi Jinping has cultivated this sort of personal relationship with, with Vladimir Putin uh, and seems to be placing a fair bit of store by it seems to think that, you know, uh, very much the, the alignment between um, China and Russia, at least on the, the core broad goals of resisting what they see as American hegemony, uh, resisting block politics, NATO expansion and so forth. Um, you know, that, that's something worth making a lot of noise about. And, uh, and he continues to do so. Um, so I don't think that we necessarily um, should look through the, the, the prism of our own interests and the way that we would go about um, these types of relationships when, uh, when looking at what she actually wants to get out of the partnership. That was Matthew Sussex, a security analyst with the Griffith Asia Institute, speaking to our reporter Jaime Ocon. In more news about Russia, Russia's President Vladimir Putin has made a surprise visit to the Ukrainian city of Mariupol. It's Putin's first trip to Russia's newly occupied territory in Ukraine since the start of the war last year. Mariupol fell to Russia in May. It was Russia's first major military victory in Ukraine after it failed to seize the capital city, Kyiv, and focused instead on the southeast of the country. The Kremlin says Putin visited on Saturday. Reports of his trip come just days after the International Criminal Court issued a warrant for his arrest. The Russian president is accused of war crimes and illegally deporting hundreds of children from Ukraine. Back in Taiwan, President Tsai Ing-wen met with a delegation of UK lawmakers on Monday. The lawmakers are members of a pro-Taiwan caucus in the British Parliament. They are in Taiwan on a six-day trip. During the meeting, Tsai wished the UK success in its bid to join the CPTPP regional free trade bloc. She asked the UK to back Taiwan's bid to join the bloc in turn once it secures membership. Taiwanese archers have won two gold medals in the opening stage of this year's Asia Cup. National Taiwan Sport University in the northern city of Taoyuan is the host of this year's tournament. Taiwan won the women's recurve team event, while Taiwan's Ling Jiayu claimed gold in the individual women's recurve event. In more from the world of sports, Taekwondo Olympic medalist Luo Jialing has won silver at the Belgian Open. Luo's path to the achievement wasn't an easy one. It's been a rough month for Taiwan's Taekwondo Olympic medalist Luo Jialing. Over the past two months or so, she's traveled to five countries, Turkey, Thailand, the United States, the Netherlands and Belgium. Luo was scheduled to compete in four competitions over that period. But things didn't pan out the way she hoped. The competition in Turkey was canceled 
after a devastating earthquake hit the country in early February. Then, in the United States, Lowell was disqualified because she was 0.1 kilogram over her weight class. She cut her hair to tip the scales in her favor, but to no avail. Her fortunes turned in mid-March, where she won bronze at an event in the Netherlands. Then on Saturday, Lowell picked up silver at the Belgian Open. Though second place is nothing to scoff at, Lowell seemed disappointed she did not clinch gold. And expectations for fourth seed Luo were high when she managed to pull off an early upset at the Belgian Open. Taekwondo's governing body made pushing at competitions legal last June. 21-year-old Luo is vulnerable to the rule change since she's 185 centimeters tall, meaning there's more of her to push. Though at a disadvantage, her ability to come through and win medals shows that the change is just a speed bump in her promising career. But after this latest slew of competitions, there's only one thing on Luo's mind, having a good square meal back home in Taiwan. Coming up, we take a look at what this year's historic Oscar wins mean for Asian representation in Hollywood. Taiwan 60 Hertz, every Wednesday, 8.30 p.m. on Taiwan Plus. Thanks for watching Taiwan Plus. For more great stories from Taiwan and around the world, please download the Taiwan Plus app. Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Ian Kavat. This very aggressive form of cultural revolution-like politics in China seems to be moving forward in this modern era. This grave injustice is happening. I said Xi Jinping will not give up his ambition. We need that kind of mindset to prepare for the warfare. What implications does this have on Taiwan and the region as a whole? Just like Ukraine right now, you need people to understand we're doing this for our own country. Reaffirmed our support for the Taiwanese ability to make their own decisions about their own future. It's very hard to duplicate in the short time. Taiwan still can continue being the leading position if we will put efforts on R&D. And you are riding on a wave. This is exactly the time you need to double down. I did not realize I am actually running to be the first Asian woman in the state senate. Our next generation, they can see Asian American is as equal and have the same platform. Taiwan Talks provides a platform for the voices and perspectives that are shaping our country. Welcome back. You're watching Tao Plus News. The singer of Oscar-winning song Natu Natu has received a massive welcome after returning to India. Huge crowds of fans greeted Rahul Siplingunj at the airport when he arrived in his home city of Hyderabad over the weekend. Beating out tracks from Lady Gaga and Rihanna, Natu Natu from the film RRR is the first ever song from an Indian film to win an Academy Award. This year's Oscars saw several historic wins for Asian and Asian-American talent. 
The night's biggest winner, Everything Everywhere All at Once, took home seven Oscars, including Best Picture. The movie's lead, Michelle Yeoh, also became the first Asian woman to win Best Actress in the Academy's 95-year history. This year's Academy Awards marked some change since the hashtag OscarsSoWhite began to trend eight years ago. For more on how representation at award shows has evolved, our reporter Joyce Sung spoke with theater professor Shanti Palai from Williams College. Given your expertise in Asian and Asian American performance, what does this year's Oscars signal to you? Well, I think uh, the past week is clear evidence that there has been an evolution. Um, it's really a historic moment in time that we see these wonderful um, Asian actors recognized for their wonderful work, um, that we see actors in roles that are not stereotypes. So I think there's no doubt that the world has changed very much since, certainly since the beginning of the film era and even well into the 20th century, when we had characters who were very, very um, stereotypical, um, uh, rather than as complex, noble uh, human beings. What are some obstacles or questions you see coming out of this year's Oscars? Well, I guess the first question that it raises in my mind, in the minds of many of us who, as scholars, consider these issues, is to think about how we register what progress towards what we commonly refer to now in the United States as diversity, equity, and inclusion would be. How do we, what is, what constitutes progress? And whether a very elite film academy giving awards to superstar actors is in and of itself indicative that a society has progressed. As you mentioned, the issue of diversity and representation is incredibly complex. Are there any specific lessons that you see coming out of this year's awards? One example I thought to name here today um, was that, that shows to me some of the complexity of this win this past week. We all know that this, this film, this mega global blockbuster RRR, a film from India, um, won for best song, but the song was performed as the best song usually is on stage during the Oscar proceedings. And there were no, it seems, that there were no South Asian identified dancers in the group uh, of dancers who performed that number at the Oscars. And how is it possible that in a night in which there's so much celebration about representation of Asians and Asian Americans, that even the dance number that accompanies the song from the Indian film does not have South Asian representation. And one other little example is that Jimmy Kimmel, the host for the Oscars this year, referred to the film RRR as a Bollywood film. Well, Bollywood refers to the Hindi language movie industry in India, but RRR is not a Hindi film, it's a Telugu film. That was Shanti Palai, theater professor at Williams College in Massachusetts, USA, speaking with Taiwan Plus reporter Joyce Tsun. Millions of dead fish have washed up in a river near a small town in rural Australia. The dead fish have caused serious problems for both local and indigenous communities who are still recovering from flash floods which hit the area last November. But the phenomenon also indicates the more serious environmental challenges currently facing the country. Sally Jensen reports. Silvery bodies blanket the surface of this outback river. It's estimated that the number of dead fish here is in the millions. The smell of the rotting fish is overpowering. It's a nightmare for the residents of nearby town Broken Hill. It's pretty hard to comprehend, really. You know, it's um, from the flood and, and the worry and everything there. And we've just sort of started to, to clean up. And, um, and then this has happened. And that's just sort of you're walking around in a, 
a dried up mess and then you're smelling this putrid smell and it's, it's a terrible smell and, and horrible to see all those dead fish. Last November, the area was hit by flash floods. This wrecked around 80% of local homes and businesses. The death of these fish has been blamed on low oxygen levels in the water, which occurred as the floods receded, combined with an ongoing heat wave. The state's Department of Planning and Environment's Water Division said on Twitter that dissolved oxygen levels remain a concern for fish health in the area. Local Aboriginal leaders also worry that ecological disasters could cause depression among Indigenous communities. We just know that the level of depression, um, you know, the cultural significance, the spiritual, you know, um, that it means to the Aboriginal people, and when the when the drought, when it's when it's like it is now, it, it's just a feeling of hopelessness that, that you, no one wants to take any responsibility for it, and really all we want is to maintain a healthy river. Human-caused climate change is expected to make storm and flood events like these more severe. Right now, they cost the New South Wales economy almost 170 million US dollars every year. Burning fossil fuels remains the biggest contributor to rising global temperatures. And last year, oil companies doubled their profits from 2021 to around 200 billion US dollars. But in rural Australia, people like the residents of Broken Hill are left to try and cope with a catastrophe on their doorstep. Ethan Pan and Sally Jensen for Taiwan Plus. The water level in central Taiwan's Sun Moon Lake has dropped three and a half meters in two weeks as a month long drought shows no sign of easing. It's another sign of the country's ongoing water shortage, which could become Taiwan's worst drought in more than 75 years. The lack of rainfall is being linked to La Nina, a weather phenomenon that has brought lower temperatures to the Pacific, west of South America, and more extreme ones to Taiwan. This could make cycles of prolonged droughts and extreme flooding more frequent in the future. The Taiwan International Festival of Arts is currently underway, and one production in particular is captivating local audiences. It tells the stories of humanitarian workers in conflict zones. Yvon Yang has more. Pounding beats like the sound of a war drum or heartbeats. This is the play Dona Masu de Lampasuple, directed and written by the director of Festival de Vignon, Tiago Rodriguez. It's a part of Taiwan International Festival of Arts, also known as TIFA. Tifa也是亚洲区非常重要的一个艺术盛会哦，所以我们常常会定位这个艺术节，它是一个呃台湾看世界、世界看台湾一个很重要的表演艺术节。那呃疫情过后呢，其实我们也等待了三年，才有机
Eight-year-old Mori Shizuo serves about 50 puddings a day in his small Tokyo coffee shop. These flings of the arm help dislodge the custard from the tin. It's a technique that has earned him a worldwide audience via videos his customers spread on TikTok and other social media. Mori's been surprised by his social media fame and the lines of foreigners queuing up outside his coffee shop now that Japan has lifted its pandemic border restrictions. I saw it on TikTok and it seemed like a very nice local story. Uh, and to be honest, I'm a big cream caramel fan. Japan, like Taiwan, reopened to tourists in October. In March, Japan's tourism agency said that visitor numbers broke one million for a third straight month in February. But that's still down 43 percent from before the pandemic. Like many, Mori struggled through the pandemic. Now, thanks to social media, his coffee shop is recovering. He's just sorry that, with all his new fans, there aren't enough puddings to go around. Klein Wong and Louise Watt for Taiwan Plus. Thank you for watching Tom Plus News. I'm Leslie Liao. Take care and see you next time.